Good morning, friends. What a joy to see you on this holiday weekend as we celebrate the privileges and responsibilities of the freedom that we have been entrusted with. Thank you for being here and for being in town this weekend. We're blessed by your presence and we want to warmly welcome you into the life and fellowship of Sycamore Presbyterian. We encourage you to use the friendship pads as a way of noting your presence and to making each other feel at home. This is a special place to live, to grow, to serve, and we are delighted to greet you this morning. Have a couple of things we'd like to highlight for you. If you're with us and you don't have a congregational home in the greater Cincinnati area, make Sycamore your church home. We're offering a new members class on Saturday, July the 30th. We know that schedule works for some. It's a Saturday morning class. If you'd like to register, just contact the main office. For those of you who aren't real good about opening your email, you can get a hard copy each Sunday morning of the email distribution that we do each Friday. And that distribution is of some detail, really, giving you insights into things happening in our life and work. We also remind you that occasionally there's a video attached, as there was this week uh, by Shirley Hutchins, an inspirational moment. And so we encourage you to open those up. But if you need a hard copy at the hospitality table in the narthex, you can grab one. There are few things more American than coffee and donuts, right? Yep, you agree, you know. But we need some willing hands and souls to serve five to six times a year in that ministry to support it. Most of us benefit from it. But organizationally, you know, it's one of those things that anybody believes that somebody will do it, and so nobody does it. Well, we have a few people doing it, and they're faithful, but they need some support. And we would invite you to consider sharing in this special ministry of hospitality. This week, there's a service opportunity at the Sugar Tree Ministry in Wilmington. It'll be a luncheon service. There's details about how you can participate in that. Our senior adult ministry, Triple L, Living Longer and Liking It, invites members of this church family to consider their upcoming trip to New York City, October 6th through 11th. You could register for that today by sharing your deposit. And your continued faithfulness to the church is appreciated over these summer months. But we also draw your particular attention to the above and beyond effort Presently attempting to secure, before we break ground, support for an enlarged narthex area to make certain that we have adequate, uh, what do you, what's the right word, my, my brain has lost track, adequate gathering space to help us in the life of this church family not only continue to connect in a meaningful way, but to thoughtfully involve more people in our wider life and work. That also includes a uh, large portico that will be of particular interest uh, to people when the weather is inclement and you would like to be dropped off. Uh, There's information about that that's been shared. There's more that will be forthcoming, but we would encourage your own prayerful consideration of what uh, you might do. This is an invitation to support this in any way possible, and your prayers are certainly appreciated. There are so many things happening in our wider life and work. We encourage you to note them. Uh, The rhythm may change a little over the summer, but things around here never stop. And so find a way to serve, to grow, and to celebrate God's blessings for you in every way. As we turn now with Verla Weeder to our call to worship. Good morning. Will you join with me in the call to worship? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. In God, God we trust, we will not be afraid. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. In God, we trust, we will not be afraid. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. In God, we trust, we will not be afraid. Let us worship God.
standing and join with me in the prayer of confession. Mighty and merciful God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we have not lived up to our calling. We have been timid and frightened disciples, forgetful of your powerful presence and the strength of your spirit among us. O oh God, forgive our foolish and sinful ways. As you have chosen us and claimed us in our baptisms, strengthen us anew to choose Christ's way in this world. Give us your Holy Spirit, that each one in ministry may be provided with all the gifts of grace needed to fulfill our common calling. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hear the good news. This statement is completely reliable and should be universally accepted. Christ Jesus entered the world to rescue sinners. He personally bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and be alive to all that is good. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. seated, I want to invite you to take your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow for our first scripture lesson this morning, to be found in Paul's letter to the Galatian church, Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read verse 1 and verses 13 through 15. You can follow along in your pew Bibles on page 1815. The title of this section is Freedom in Christ. Paul writes these words to the Galatian church. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then verses 13 through 15. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out. Or you will be destroyed by each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I'd like to invite the children to come on up and join me for a little special time. Come on up, young folks. Maybe visiting another church. All righty. But today, we want to spend just a little time thinking about this very special holiday weekend. 
This is our day that we celebrate the birth of our great country. You really like living in America, don't you? Boy, we do, because it's really the greatest place on the face of the earth. And we just got think that God had something to do with it, and that he blessed us and allowed us to be a part of his great work in our lives. And Pastor Kent has a sermon title and coming out of some songs, and one of them is, Oh, Say Can You See? Well, kind of makes you want to say, See what? Right? So, I brought me something so I could see. Some binoculars. Let's see out here. You know what? That is a great sermon type. Oh, my goodness. Look back there at Mr. <laughs> Prince. I, you've got to behave yourself, Mr. Prince. I can see you. <laughs> and then, you know, look, boys and girls, if I look out the window, I can see a long way. And I can see, boy, beautiful trees and birds and people and things. Do you know what living in this country means? It means that we have the freedom to see beyond just what's right now. And these binoculars illustrate that. We could probably use binoculars symbolically and say, faith is like, and the scriptures are like a binocular for us to help us see the things of God. And we want to see in this country that God has blessed us with many things. He's blessed us with opportunity and, and school to learn and knowledge and parents and friends and, and traveling and vacations. So we get to see a lot of things in our freedom, don't we? And it's way beyond. We get to see something of our future because our schools help us to know that if we work hard, if we study and learn, we can just about do anything we want to do, can't we? In terms of career, in terms of enjoying life, in terms of having life be really good. Wouldn't you like that to make life good? We've got to work at it, don't we? It's not going to be just handed to us and we can't just sit around and do it. And we've got to get out there and help make it work. So I brought something else with me to, send, to help us understand about today. A work band. You know what that? Look at that. A good old American work band right there. I could put that on there. And man, I could get to work and just because work is a privilege. To, a lot of people can't work and they wish they could because when we work, God does something in us and it's fun and we achieve and we see what we've done with our hands. And yesterday, my son and I and wife, we were working and you'd never know what we were doing. In this great America, and I was hauling a, a, a sledgehammer busting concrete. Do you believe that? It's true, that's what I was doing. We were redoing a sidewalk, okay, at the house. And I work, but you know, we have the privilege here to work hard. And freedom gives us the ability to work hard and get rewarded for it. And that's just exciting, boys and girls. And so it doesn't hurt to put on a good old sweatband of work and hard labor and, and make your dreams come true. And, and you can do that, okay? Freedom lets us do that. Isn't that great? So that's what the, is meant by, oh, say, can we see? Can we see the great freedom that God has for us? And we can use it and be blessed by God. So I got some, one other thing here that I want to show you. I brought with me. And I bet you'd never get, well, I got one more. Never guess what that is. Can you guess what that? Feel how heavy that thing is. That's a heavy little thing, isn't it? Yeah. And look here, everybody. It's a. You have any idea what that is? It has no name. It's not anything. It's about as good for nothing except for a good old paperweight. That's all it is. There's nothing special about that, but it represents something. You see this shaft? This came off of a shaft, and these are grooved for gears. And at one time, that was a part of a big old machine. And when that thing turned, it would turn gears and wheels, and it would make machine work. And that's what that represents. And when you look at that, you think of this great country who is in, has a lot of ingenuity, creativity, can use machines that make these things, and it makes other things work. And our lives are just really blessed by that. Isn't that great? Man, that's great. And this right here, he put on here. This was a gift to me from a guy, and he said he thought had me in mind. I kind of wonder what that means, but he had me in mind when he did that. But um, he had to make this because this is a, ra a ratchet of a sort, a, a socket, and it was a tool for working on machines. 
But he had one that had a, a spot in it that he had to have this little thing cut right. He had to put this in here. So he cut it, he made it, he, he welded it together, and he made it, and, and it made him be able to do his work. He was able to slide that into that slot and put that in there, and then he could turn it and crank it and make and repair it and do what he wanted. That's all because of great freedom and ingenuity and knowledge. And that's what we have in this great country. So, and that's what we're celebrating this weekend. So we can see some of the future and the blessings and the opportunities. We can work and work hard for it. And that's what freedom gives us. And we can, we can remember things that we've made. So then, when we wave our flag, we give thanks to God, don't we? Because the flag represents... The red represents blood shed, for the battles won for freedom. The white, the pureness of our hope and the good things that freedom brings. And, of course, the blue and the stars, the states and the, the many pe- people that live in different places that work hard and enjoy these freedoms. It's a beautiful flag, isn't it? And y'all have some things you wear. Look at these girls. They let all dressed up for a special day today and people wearing their pins. It's just great boys and girls. I just want to encourage you. Let's do a little flag waving this weekend, okay? And enjoy the freedom that God gives us in this great country. Let's pray. Loving God, indeed, we are truly blessed. Among all the peoples of the earth, we enjoy some of the best blessings the world's ever known. May we not take it for granted. May these boys and girls enjoy the holidays and their summer and the freedoms that they're given the opportunities before them. Give them with faith the eyes to see some things you can do for us and lead us. Help us to work hard and help us to enjoy the fruits of our labors. And loving God, may we honor you in all of this. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, boys and girls. Thanks for coming.
be seated. Our second scripture lesson today, taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, and you can find it on page 1663 of your pew Bible if you want to follow along. Titled, The Children of Abraham, John writes these words. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you please pray with me? Gracious God, lift us to the high calling we've heard that we might know your truth and be free indeed in ways that allow us the blessing of glorifying you through Christ our living Lord. Amen. Of all weekends, this is one weekend where we pay attention to American history and it comes alive for you in a more meaningful way when you get to brush up alongside it, which is something that Joyce and I had the joy of doing about a week and a half ago. We made up some lost time from a trip we had to cancel back in May when my knee was a little more involved in surgery. We were only gone four days, but we went to far eastern Pennsylvania, almost to the Delaware border, an area known as Brandywine. Some of you have been there. And really, the original intent was to follow in the footsteps of the Wyeth family. Joyce loves art. And the Wyeth family, N.C., Andrew, and Jamie, spent significant time in that Chad's Ford area. Now, I'm not so artistically sophisticated, but I've learned a lot, and much of it is fascinating. Nearby is a Revolutionary War battlefield from the Battle of Brandywine. And it does something to you when you realize that you're looking at that home in which General George Washington fulfilled his duties as commander. Well, one of the things we toured was a Brandywine River Museum with so much of American art. And one of the paintings that captured my imagination really was not done by the Wyeth family at all, but by a man whose name you wouldn't necessarily know. His name was Howard Pyle. Pyle painted in the mid to late 1800s. He was a teacher of N.C. Wyeth. And the painting that really touched me was called The Nation Makers. It obviously depicts a small group of rag-tag Americans with terrific pride and purpose going into battle in the Revolutionary War. I bought a copy of the print. It's out in the narthex today if you'd like to see it. For me, at least, it's quite stirring it also reminds us of the sacrifices of our forebearers who fought valiantly against rough odds. So Howard Pyle's painting really spoke to me. And I was reading a little bit about him, and I recognized the name Vincent Van Gogh. Now, most of us have heard of Van Gogh. And the comment was made that Van Gogh said, I looked at Pyle's work and I was struck dumb in admiration. Now, the truths of history impact our lives in so many ways. As we left Brandywine and headed home, we stopped off in Gettysburg. Many of you have been to Gettysburg they are anticipating lots of visitors as we now enter into the 150th anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War. 
In two years, of course, it will be uh, the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. They're really getting ready. They're paving the roads. In fact, they were paving the one outside our bed and breakfast all night long. (laughs) And from our little porch, you could look across the street and up the hill, and there was the site where Lincoln had given the Gettysburg Address. It does something to you. And to consider the fact that at the time, he was disappointed by his own effort doing in two minutes what a minister who preceded him was unable to do in two hours. Lincoln, for many, is the quintessential American, a man of dramatic presence, a strength of spiritual devotion with a wonderful common touch. And it brought some Lincolnisms to mind. Imagine him saying, I destroy my enemies when I make them my friends. He has a right to criticize who has a heart to help. I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. If I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six of them sharpening my axe. I always walk slowly, but never backwards. If I was two-faced, would I wear this one? (laughs) I've come to learn that mercy yields richer fruit than strict justice. What a legacy he has left. A century and a half later, we are still fascinated by his gifts and qualities of leadership where he carried the burdens of our nation, and you could see him age in the process. I've always believed that America is its most noble when it is its most visionary. Going back to the time of the Revolutionary War, there was a Presbyterian pastor who was very outspoken. His name was John Witherspoon, And he thundered from his pulpit saying that there wasn't a single incident in the history of humanity where civil liberty was lost and and religious liberty preserved. For him, this fight for independence was a fight for religious freedom to serve and worship God as we so chose. He lost family in the Revolutionary War. He served for about a decade as the president of then Princeton College. There was actually a Revolutionary War skirmish on the Princeton campus. And representing the people, he put his name on the Declaration of Independence. The only minister to be so noted. For him, there was a blessing and a burden of responsibility with freedom. He could have been signing his life away. But to him, freedom meant you have to stand up. And you have to continue to work for the common good. You know, we don't always translate freedom this way, but sometimes it can mean that one of the ways we exercise our freedom is to even be willing in certain circumstances to vote more taxes on ourselves when we believe the outcome is right. It was Abraham Lincoln who observed that the ballot is more powerful than the bullet. In 
If you go about another hundred years into American history, you hear Lincoln agonizing to establish somehow a framework that will allow this nation to be reunified. He never lost his heart, his love, his affection for his fellow countrymen and women, north and south. Because he had such a common touch. He knew the very things that griped the guts of people. He identified with the brokenness of human suffering. And so, several months each year, he would really move the White House operations out to the soldiers' home, several miles outside of town, where many of the seriously wounded from the war were given the opportunity to have a permanent residence. Lincoln felt at home there, and he would commute in during those months to Washington. He would say, a nation divided against itself cannot stand. And by his energies and efforts, we were finally able to build bridges that ended the war and allowed the country to begin that difficult work of being reunited. I wish the Presbyterian Church had been so agile. It took us 120 years to get North and South back together. Sometimes in the life of the church, we can even have too limited a vision. But you go yet another 100 years down the cycle of history, and you hear a voice that is really a bit of a clarion call into the future in John F. Kennedy. I'll never attempt to replicate his accent. But he said, we choose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And it will require the most noble of human aspirations to accomplish this. Which is one reason why on July the 20th, 1969, as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin neared the fulfillment of that vision, we felt, those of us at least who were alive at the time, we felt caught up in something bigger than ourselves. Something grand for the human spirit. A clear demonstration of what is possible if we work together and say yes to opportunities. And it wasn't just distinctively American. The goodness of what our fellow countrymen and women had worked together to realize touched all aspects of the globe. For that one moment in time, it appeared as if somehow, with a deep sense of awe, our world was caught up in something wondrous. Sometimes in our ability to move so quickly through time, we miss some of the gifts of those who have served this nation thoughtfully, sacrificially, and well. Depending upon who you read, there clearly are those who might say that the most effective general in the Civil War was on the losing side, Robert E. Lee. A statesman, a gentleman, a man of devout Christian character, it was said of Lee that his soldiers respected him so much that they would fight to the end because they didn't want to disappoint him. What a grasp. On the other side of the coin, history hasn't always been kind to our own U.S. grant. So often, and regrettably so, there seems to be such an emphasis placed upon his drinking it's almost a one-dimensional view of Grant, of whom Lincoln said, that man can fight. And when he was needed, he really did. But one of the great things you could appreciate is to travel just down the road to Point Pleasant and go to his boyhood home, which is open, I think, April to October. It's fascinating. I learned that by today's standards, Grant was considered a horse whisperer. He somehow understood horses and what they were communicating. As a young lad of 12 or 13, 
The story goes that he would take groups as far north as Toledo because he knew his way through the forests and through the byways. He was skilled at navigating as a young man. Many don't appreciate the fact that this man was an artist. And he wrote with a prose that many could never achieve, even with extended schooling. Many have found his memoirs to be especially meaningful. These are our forebearers, and many, many more. About America, Gerald Ford observed as president, he said, America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. I, for one, am proud of what I understand to be a portion of the legacy of being the United States. You know, it seems to me from the things that I take in that when there's disaster on a global scale, some other corner of the world, it seems that America often assumes that role of first responder We show up with personnel, with monies, with supplies in a way that I think is breathtaking and is a terrific role model of what it means to use freedom responsibly, to care. America often is in that role out in front trying to help others appreciate what kind of constructive role even their nation might play. I'm proud of that when I see that in America. I know there are limits financially to what you can do. I get that piece. But it's the desire to try to respond somehow that brings forth from the rest of us the awareness that our vision is never adequate if it's just about ourselves. And that's so much of the gospel calling of what it means to be the church of Christ. So many of these efforts that provide human relief beyond our boundaries were birthed in the life of God's people. We're here for a purpose, to bring honor to God's name and presence by who we are and what we're about. People do it in a whole host of ways. One of the personalities that is often at play, pardon the pun, during this time of the year is the stirring work of John Philip Sousa. It's hard to be an American and not have been stirred by a Sousa march. What many of us don't know is that for the old recordings of the Sousa band, almost all of them were without John Philip in the director's seat. He did not like to record. He didn't seem to have a lot of use for that modern technology of the 1920s. And when I came across something about a year ago that was John Philip Sousa directing his band, I knew I needed to save it in the hopes that its presence might stir a few of us. I want you to take just a moment and hear John Philip at the helm playing a signature piece. What many wouldn't know was the way that piece was translated 60 years later. In a wholly American, wholly stirring, wholly wonderful kind of thing. Through the care of a, one who could be called a Soviet dissident. His name was Mstislav Rostropovich. Some might recognize that name. Some believed he played the cello better than anyone in the world. 
But he challenged the government of the Soviet Union and got into trouble repeatedly. For a period of time, he housed, along with his wife, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was one of the premier Soviet dissidents. For some of his actions, he got officially booted out of the Soviet Union. Stripped of his citizenship, he came to America. He loved this land. He loved its freedoms. He became an American citizen. And this Soviet musician became the conductor of our National Symphony in Washington. Think of that. Kind of interesting, really. You have a Soviet conductor of the National Symphony. And as the Soviet Union began to crumble, he was invited back to be restored as a citizen of his homeland. An unprecedented thing. Sixteen years later, Slava, as he was affectionately called, returned, but this time armed with our National Symphony Orchestra. They would play two concerts in the Moscow Conservatory. Imagine this. He's now going home as an American citizen. He'll also be a Soviet citizen. He's got the National Symphony Orchestra with him, playing in the Moscow Conservatory. And he offers this encore to his own countrymen and women, and they love it. The stars and stripes forever. This is live. His Christian name means, quite literally, I believe, honored one. Our best use of freedom is to appropriate it in a way that lifts up the dignity of life, that stirs the human heart and brings great glory to God. A year later, the the Soviet Union ended. And for me, at least, part of the legacy that Mstislav Rostropovich left this world was his return to Russia with the stars and stripes forever. The ripples of that freedom lived out faithfully and well go around the world. It calls us to our best and most faithful response to life and a focus beyond ourselves. And a reminder that we have a rich heritage and we have a legacy to leave for those who will follow. Now sometimes, particularly in challenging economic times, it is very easy to have the focus be primarily on ourselves. And I understand that. The Kent family is no different than you are. We understand that times there are heavy financial drains and responsibilities, and we all try to use what we have thoughtfully and well. And part of our desire is to also leave something bigger than ourselves. I'm grateful that at this stage in the life of Sycamore, we are looking back to our rich heritage 
and we are looking forward to our rich opportunity. And part of what we're striving to accomplish is to also leave a legacy that will continue to bless and enrich the life and fellowship of this congregation in generations to come. This reminds all of us that it is never just about ourselves. It is about doing what we can to further God's work in this time and place and in our very midst. And it challenges us to raise our level of vision upward and at its best, heavenward. And there's one who said it really well, better than I can. And he chose to write about it in words that became our national anthem. Francis Scott Key. How stirring to begin, O oh, say can you see. What you may not know is that for many years in his adult life, Francis Scott Key was vice president of the American Bible Society. And he chose to say that we see our forward vision at its best when we see it through the lens of God's word. May we have a commitment to do that. May we see what God has before us. And may we have the joyful blessing to always respond. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepare to bow before God, we remember those who have special needs of healing blessings from our Lord. And we also remember those who in our military services are striving somehow to be able to bring peace, a sense of freedom and quality of life to people throughout the whole face of the earth. We're also mindful of those who lead our church, need the wisdom from God. Join me in bowing as we offer these prayers up that are common to us all. Let us pray. Gracious, loving, and almighty God, we just cannot help but pause for a moment and breathe deep and relax from wrestling against everything and just give thanks for the beauty of this day, the gift of life, and this hour of worship. For we have come to be in your presence in a special way in this hour, to hear from you, to be encouraged and lifted up by your spirit, to be challenged by your truth and your words, and to embrace the love and salvation and mercy and grace that you have offered to us. And Lord God, to simply give you thanks for the privilege of living in freedom and in this United States of America. May we never be among those who take it for granted and abuse that freedom for the wrong and evil deeds we, can, we human beings can do. But Lord God, lift us up in this freedom, in your freedom, from the slavery of sin itself to the new life in Christ Jesus, to a walk of faith and to the great things you have before us. Be gracious and merciful and generous in your healing blessings to those who need those today. Grant success with the efforts for peace through our military services and throughout the world. Grant wisdom from on high for all decisions we make with this church that we may be precisely and exactly what you wanted us to be in this community. And in all this, may you be glorified. And Lord God, in your glorification, bless us as we pray and commit ourselves to you praying as you've taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With hearts, yeah.
Oh. Hmm? <laughs> Got a lot of freedom here. Hang on a second. <laughs> Okay. How's that? That's good. <laughs> Flexibility, right? I forgot the national anthem. I came down from up there and was anxious to pray. <laughs> Lord, be gracious to us. The national anthem. And then the offering. <laughs>
multitask down here. And we've been moving back and forth. And uh, we were up there doing some streaming bit, responding to those who are on the line with our services. It is a great joy to be able to do that. In the process, I get a little confused every once in a while. But God's good, isn't it? And he blesses all of us. And to our TD land, God bless you also. <laughs> Let's pray. Loving God, living in this land of freedom, we can take it for granted and not realize the wealth of resources you've given to us to be, for which to be good students. But you are always good to us. With joy in our hearts, we offer these expressions of our devotion. May they be blessed by you to spread your good news in our hearts and our lives, this church family, this community, even to the uttermost parts of the earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> The music really does stir our hearts. So does the memory of the debt we owe to brave men and women down through history who have served and suffered and sacrificed that we might know the blessings of the freedom we know today. May we be worthy of the gift they have given to us. And may all that we do honor our God and so go with joy.
Live in faith. Believe that life is good. And if you find it not, help make it so. To the glory of God who made us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, friendship, and power of the Holy Spirit lead us forward together each step of the way. Amen.